Hello friends. So in this uh, video, we shall be covering two major objectives. One, psychoanalysis as a form of therapy and the specific techniques that are used by a psychoanalyst. Now, psychoanalysis broadly refers to three things. A model of human and personality development, a theory of personality and human nature, and a form of psychotherapy. In the present module, we shall be using it in the third sense, that is, as a form of psychotherapy. Developed in the 1890s by Austrian neurologist Sigmund Freud, psychoanalysis can be seen as a set of therapeutic techniques that help an individual release pent-up emotions or repressed thoughts, feelings and memories. Freud's theory was based on his own personal observations and careful study of his patients, the famous case studies. His interest in the role of the unconscious in influencing human behavior was a result of the intriguing case of what we now know as Anna O, who experienced physical symptoms like visual disturbances, speech problems, partial paralysis without any apparent physical cause. It was only when she was able to recall memories of traumatic experiences during her childhood which she had repressed or blocked, that her symptoms subsided. So various approaches to counseling have been developed, which have roots in classical psychoanalysis of Sigmund Freud. In fact, counseling as a discipline owes a lot to the ideas and techniques of Freud. He has contributed immensely to not just the field of psychotherapy, but psychology at large. Now these theories, that have their basis in Freudian psychoanalysis are called psychodynamic theories and they all share some common principles. Now let us discuss those principles. So one of the most important principle of psychodynamic theories is the belief in the unconscious and psychic determinism which basically means that our thoughts, feelings, behavior, personality is determined by the unconscious aspects of a psyche. It is determined by unconscious motivation or childhood events. So that is the first principle, that is the role of the unconscious. The second is the behavior is the result of the interplay of internal drives and instincts. There is immense role of childhood experiences, especially the first five years in determining one's personality and present life issues. So the role of the past is very, very significant. The childhood experiences are very significant in shaping our present personality and problems that we face in today's time. Clients' insight during therapy is the key internal mechanism for change to occur. So these are also therefore called insight-based therapies because they rely on the insight that the client develops through the process of psychotherapy. And the other assumption which all these psychodynamic theories share is the use of defense mechanisms by the ego to avoid feeling anxiety. So the term psychodynamic is a generic or an umbrella term that covers number of theoretical schools which although they all have their origins in Freud's ideas, they have developed their own different models. So some have emphasized the ego more, some have emphasized the defense mechanisms more, some have emphasized the uh, developmental years more and the interaction with the parents or the parenting more. So, but in today's uh, discussion, we'll talk about psychoanalysis and not psychodynamic. Psychoanalysis is founded on the concept of conflicting forces. The inner drives, wishes, memories and ideas, which are mostly unconscious, they, that interact within the psyche. The unconscious wants to manifest itself, but since the unconscious is made up of unwanted urges and desires like sexual urges or aggressive impulses or painful and traumatic memories that we don't want to remember, irrational fears, shameful experiences. So either these things are too painful or too undesirable 
for it to manifest directly in our awareness. So therefore, because the unconscious consists of those aspects which are not very desirable, which are very painful, it cannot manifest directly. It manifests itself in disguised ways, in indirect ways. What are these indirect ways? There are many ways in which the unconscious manifests itself. For example, slip of the tongue. So I want to say something, but I say something else. Then there are psychopathologies of everyday life. It's the title of a book that has been written by Freud, in which he talks about small pathologies like forgetting names, right? Which could be an example of how the unconscious is trying to manifest itself. Dreams or free association, defenses, symptom formation, like excessive washing of the hands or psychosomatic problems like headaches or migraines. All these could be examples of the ways in which our unconscious tries to manifest itself. So when the client comes to the counselor with the presenting issue, it is mostly the compromise formation of the its impulses. So because the its impulses cannot be uh, satisfied directly, they are trying to manifest themselves in compromised forms. Now to quote Freud, Sigmund Freud, what he says is, we find a struggle between two trends of which one is unconscious and ordinarily repressed and strives towards satisfaction, which he calls wish fulfillment, while the other belonging probably to the conscious ego, which is disapproving and repressive. The outcome of this conflict is a compromise formation, the dream or the symptom, in which both trends have found an incomplete expression. So in psychoanalysis, the attempt is to help the person identify and accept their defenses and other unconscious materials and create more mature ego responses that are more mature ways of satisfying those desires. So now let us move to the goals of psychoanalysis. The primary goal of psychoanalysis is to make the unconscious conscious. It is said, one cannot fight an enemy, one cannot see. So if unconscious is determining everything that we are, that we are experiencing in our life, it's the source of all kinds of issues and problems that we are facing in our life, it is important to get in touch with one's unconscious and to be able to deal with it. So that is the major goal of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis focuses on unconscious processes as they are manifested in a person's present behavior. Therefore, the goal of psychoanalytic therapy is client's self-awareness and understanding of the influence of the past on the present behavior. Now, Baker has given uh, some common goals that all type of psychoanalytic therapy share. And the first one he talks about is the reduction in the intensity of the id's irrational impulses and corresponding increase in the mature management of instinctual striving. So desires get fulfilled, but in acceptable ways. The second is an enhancement of the behavioral repertoire, maturity, effectiveness and flexibility of the defenses used by the individual. So an individual is no longer just rigidly reactive. The development and support of values, attitudes and expectations based on accurate assessment of reality that facilitate effective adaptation is another goal because when we use defenses, there is distortion of reality. So it's very important that we reach a state of accurately assessing the reality. Then the development of the capacity of mature intimacy and productive self-expression. Having healthy relationships is another goal. And the last one is lessening of the punitives of the superego. So we know that superego is something which, you know, punishes us through guilt and shame and all these emotions. Uh, so we have to reduce the punitives of the superego and the perfectionism that is rooted in the demands and prohibitions of the conscience. Therefore, the resolution of problems lies in understanding and resolving unconscious conflicts, strengthening of the ego, reducing the intensity of the instinctual striving, 
as well as reducing the intensity of the superego's demands and facilitating insight into one's unconscious. So these were the goals of psychoanalysis. It is important to remember that psychoanalysis is a technique driven approach. Unlike other approaches to therapy like person centered approach which are which are not based on techniques. So in psychoanalysis a number of techniques are used by the psychoanalyst in the safe environment of a clinic or an office. I am sure you would have heard about how psycho, uh, during psychoanalysis the clients are asked to lie down on a comfortable couch or sofa and to face away from the therapist so as to reduce any inhibition or intrusion by the presence of the therapist. So it's a technique driven approach and the primary technique of psychoanalysis is interpretation. It is primary, it is important because it is a part of all the other techniques that we shall discuss next. So what is interpretation? Interpretation is basically the explanations that are provided by the analyst, the psychotherapist who is trained in psychoanalysis to the client with respect to the behavior of the client. It is based on the theory of psychoanalysis. The analyst helps the client understand the meaning of the past and the present behaviors, their symptoms, their conflicts, emotions and other experiences in the light of theoretical uh, assumptions like its irrational impulses, defense mechanisms, resistance of the ego, the punitives of the superego, role of parents and caregivers, emotional challenges while growing up, etc. It is the means by which the material that is repressed in the unconscious is brought forth into the client's consciousness. The material that needs to be interpreted can come from dreams, free association, resistances, therapeutic relationship uh, like transference and counter transference. Now interpretation serves an important function that is it allows the ego to integrate the uh, under new understanding and insights into awareness. It expedites the uncovering, unraveling of the unconscious mind. Thus, the life energy that was used up in repression and other defenses becomes free for healthy use. Interpretation also needs to be very timely. They have to be timed appropriately as per the readiness of the client. If the client is not in a position to listen to, tolerate or incorporate or work with interpretations, change is not likely. So the analyst should also base the interpretation on sufficient material shared by the client. It should not be premature conclusion. You should have enough material based on different techniques like free association and dreams and recalling of the past events etc. Now the material for interpretation comes from other methods which includes free association. So in free association as we can understand uh, by reading the, uh, the term itself, it is freely associating. So in free association clients are encouraged to be relaxed and speak whatever comes to their mind without applying any kind of reasoning. So here you don't have to apply any rational censorship. At times they are asked to recall childhood memories or difficult emotional experiences and the key to a good free association is to suspend all kinds of rational judgment, self-criticism and censorship. So you don't have to think, oh, what will others think? If that thought is there, you will not be able to free associate. However, this is not an easy task. Now let us try a word association task. I shall say a few words and you have to say out aloud the word that comes to you after listening to the word that I say. Alright, ready? So dog, cat, bed, fur, coat, night. You have to immediately say another word that comes to your mind aloud. Shroud, eye, heart, sex, hate, dark. How was it? Were you able to say everything freely that was coming to your mind? I am sure many of you would have fa faced some kind of resistance in speaking. The assumption is that when we are doing free association, 
the repressed material buried in the unconscious gets released. So when we are not putting a lot of thoughts behind what we are saying, a lot of things in the unconscious, they find expression. So in the typical psychoanalytical parallels, it is the id that speaks and the ego is silent when we are free associating. So special attention is given to any kind of resistance that client shows during free association, like blocking thoughts. So the moment I said sex or bed or dark, what came to your mind, right? And whether you were able to say it freely or whether there was resistance on your part. Resistance is the reaction by the ego to any anxiety arousing repressed material. Anything that is anxiety arousing which was repressed in the unconscious when it is coming out through free association task, uh, it would obviously cause a lot of anxiety and the ego tries to repress it back or resist it. No, 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 no. The task of the analyst is to identify the repressed material and see the connections between events. So that is what we do uh, in free association. Then the next and very important technique is that of resistance. We all know that any kind of change that we have to make in life is always met with inhibitory forces. So anything that works against the progress of therapy and stops the client from generating unconscious material is resistance. Now there are different ways in which resistance can happen. For example, this client is sidetracking the discussion. So you are talking about something else but the, uh, the client is sidetracking the discussion or is refusing to recall whether it is dreams or childhood memories. You are talking about something, immediately the client is changing the uh, subject, changing the topic, many a times unknowingly, unconsciously also. At times, uh, you know, you engage in irrelevant small talks, you are missing appointments with, it, with your therapist, you are coming late for your therapy or you are postponing sessions, you are not paying your fees in time, you are forgetting to do the assignments or homeworks that were given to you by your therapist. All these things are interpreted as resistance. So resistance is a kind of reluctance on the part of the client which impedes the progress of therapy. It is important that the analyst deals with resistance immediately. Client might or might not be aware of the resistance in him or her. However, the reasons for resistance are largely unconscious. So you might know that, okay, fine, you are postponing it every time, but you are actually not knowing what is the reason behind postponing it every time. These reasons are basically defenses against the unbearable anxiety or pain that would result when the client becomes aware of the unpleasant, repressed thoughts, feelings, impulses, memories, etc. during the course of therapy. So it is a kind of fear of facing the unpleasant things that stops the person from actually introducing the change. Some resistance stems from the unwillingness or to forego the secondary gains. So we all know that when we are not well, we get a lot of attention. We can avoid a lot of responsibilities because we are ill. So you do not want to forego these secondary gains and that could also lead to resistance. Resistance can come from the id where uh, the therapy is trying to put a full stop to your need gratification that was happening through symptoms, compromise formations, right? It can uh, also come from the superego when a sense of guilt for getting better or a sense of deserving punishment in the form of illness arises in the client. So it's the client feels that I need to suffer. I have done so much of bad things in my life that I deserve all these kinds of punishment. From, uh, so that comes from the superego and that is the resistance that is coming from the superego. Now we uh, will discuss dream interpretation, another very important technique in psychoanalysis. Dreams are considered to be the royal road to the unconscious. We said that unconscious manifests itself in disguised forms and dreams are one of the most important forms through which the unconscious material comes out. All the traumatic, unacceptable, painful experiences, conflicts, motivations, emotions are buried deep within the unconscious and then dreams become the symbolic expression of these. They are compromised formations as we said, 
the process by which ideas memories or wishes that are repressed become safe for expression so we cannot express something in our real life but that can find expression in our dreams so the expression is not direct it is an indirect expression uh, because direct expression would be too painful for the ego the dreams therefore could fulfill our desires wishes fears or needs which were too threatening for the individual to fulfill directly in reality for example sexual desires in childhood are often repressed and that repressed sexual desire can manifest in the form of dreams ego defenses are weakened while we are sleeping and hence repression is lifted and therefore the unconscious material that was considered a taboo like sexual desires take the form of dreams dreams have both conscious as well as unconscious elements so the conscious elements uh, are those aspects of dream which relates to a real life and appears familiar while the unconscious element looks unfamiliar and often bizarre content of dream can be broadly divided into two one is the latent content and the other is the manifest content latent content consists of all the hidden aspects of the unconscious that find expression in symbolic language the true meaning of which has to be interpreted by the therapist the manifest content consists of all the conscious aspects the familiar aspects that the dreamer is seeing so what you actually see and report in the dream is the manifest content and what the therapist interprets the symbolic meaning of the manifest content is the latent content in dreams so in interpreting dreams the client is encouraged to free associate to the various aspects or components of the dream and to recall feelings associated with parts of the dream the client free associates with the manifest content while the analyst derives the underlying hidden meaning that is the latent content while the client is engaged in exploration of the dream through free association the therapist would look for some kind of association or links or patterns the interpretation that is offered by the therapist helps client become aware of the repressed aspects of their life thus getting new insights into their problems for example dreams of tooth breaking or grinding could reflect concerns with one's appearance or how others perceive us dreams of a bug could actually mean small problems in our day to day life that keep bugging us dreams of being naked in a public space could imply fear of being exposed or fear of revealing one's deep dark secrets so in the dream there are various processes involved uh, so that the latent content of a dream is transformed into less threatening manifest content so manifest content which is which you actually see and it can be through condensation where a lot of issues are fused into one for example uh, a male uh, client in his mid 20s reported a dream where an old woman wearing his wife's bridal dress was running away now this in therapy later on was revealed that was the fear of the client of being abandoned by his wife just as the way he was abandoned by his mother so these two abandonment issues got fused together and he saw that dream another way could be dramatization and we all know that how in dreams we see monsters and terrorists and all kinds of dramas are enacted in the dreams displacement which is basically the use of a substitute and more neutral object in the dream in the place of emotionally threatening or charged things for example there was a case of female patient who was talking about tearing apart a stuffed toy as a, a recurrent dream in her life which actually was her repressed feeling towards her own child but because she could not in real life express her ambivalence and express her negative feelings towards her own child it was represented by the stuffed toy transference and interpretation of transference is the last technique that we are going to talk about and in this basically we talk about the relationship between the client and the therapist the client and the counselor now transference as the word itself indicates you are transferring something onto the counselor so transfer occurs when the client is transferring uh, on the counselor emotional response from the past significant relationship it is the client's emotional response to the counselor as he or she did to some significant other in childhood like father mother or sibling transference feelings are not based on real relations between client and therapist so it's important to understand that it is not the therapist who is actually 
evoking these uh, reactions on the client in the client but it is the client's projection of somebody else on the therapist that is responsible for transference and it operates on the unconscious level so it is the reproduction of past relational patterns in the present context with the therapist transference is cathartic also because it releases a lot of uh, emotions that were repressed in the past transference could be positive or negative positive transference like you feel a lot of love and respect and care for the therapist you want to come for your therapy it's a positive thing and it often helps in therapy but negative transference wherein the client is projecting negative emotions of anger frustration hatred uh, repulsion onto the counselor it's called negative transference so transference is a very important tool you can say it's a very important valuable aspect of psychoanalytic treatment which will give us deep insights about the client's past relationships and how they are influencing the present functioning of my client so depending upon the kind of past relationship that is being played out you are going to project that thing on your counselor it could be paternal or it could be maternal Paternal uh, transference would be like when you project uh, onto the counselor wisdom, when you project a lot of power onto the uh, counselor. Maternal transference would be like when you are perceiving your mother figure in the in the counselor, and you uh, expect the counselor to be loving and caring and comforting and nurturing. So, uh, the therapist. It's very important that they are trained to look into the patterns of relationship between. uh the client and the counselor if the therapist does not understand the reasons for the feelings that the client has towards them and starts reacting to them therapy would be hindered so if i if my client is coming to me and saying that you uh, you are like my mother and starts projecting all the expectations that the client has of a mother from the therapist and i as a therapist start reacting to that therapy is not going to happen so it is important that the counselors must understand the transference reaction in an objective manner and try to understand that it is something from the past of the client that is being projected onto them now it is not just the client who is projecting at times it is the counselor also who is counter projecting onto the client so the reactions of the uh, the therapist the emotional response of the therapist to the client is called counter transference in classical psychoanalysis counter transference was not discussed in detail it was not something which was given importance to but in now modern psychodynamic theories you would find that they give lot of emphasis on counter transference so it is counter transference reactions are basically induced in the therapist by the client and it could serve as an important data that can be utilized to understand the ways in which the client relates uh, to the to others and how the others are feeling in the presence of the client so it helps the counselor achieve a better and deeper understanding of the problem so this is the tra transference and counter transference and this brings us to the end of this particular session so in this session we talked about uh, psychoanalysis the goals of psychoanalysis and the major techniques that are used i hope you will be able to uh, recall some of your own dreams and see how they connect with your uh, uh, past or how they connect with your uh, growing up years and what they have to tell you about your unconscious have a good day thank you so much